we can get a lot more done when we don't care who gets the credit, other than Jesus Christ. There's awareness that the point is a part of those activities, and sometimes we're leading those, but uh, that's not our main primary concern. It's that, that Jesus be, be glorified, frankly. There's a big difference between the words for and with. You can do things for a person, and that's okay. But when you do something with a person, not only are needs met, but relationships are built. At the point in Centerville, Ohio, developing relationships with the people in the area, doing ministry with other nonprofit organizations and local businesses, creating opportunities to work with others is what they do best. On this episode of Times Like These, we chat with Reverend Sam Holmes and Reverend Steve Rudisill about how this change has impacted their local church and the community in which they serve. Tell us a little bit about The Point. The Point's been around for a while, opened in 2009 as the second campus of Christ Church, Christ Church South Campus, it was called, and has had a lot of just wonderful moments over the, the past 14 years. But around the pandemic time, I was asked to go down there and just really felt that it needed a relaunch. It needed to be introduced to the community. Sam and I met with the leadership team of the church, and we just asked the question, because people that go there love the church. If we close these doors, would the people of the community miss us? Mm -hmm. And not only did they not have a good answer, we didn't either. And so we decided to relaunch and rebrand the church. We let the church uh, name itself. Um, mm -hmm. uh, How many people were part of that decision? About a dozen, mm -hmm. I would say, were in the room when we had that conversation. And when we were throwing out names, we wanted to match the vision. And the vision was going to be like, okay, well, how do we correct if no one in the community would know? How do we correct that? And someone said, I just want our church to be the center point of our community where if they are needing food, if they're needing fellowship, if they're needing, you know, just a listening ear or just a, a safe church for their family, like it, it just should be the center point of the community. So that was originally the name we liked. And then Vectran Gas Company changed their name to Center Point <laughs> like a week <laughs> later. Same week. And we said, well, we don't want to get people confused with their utility bills. <laughs> like that's not a good association. So we'll just drop the center and go with the point. So we said, okay, then we can make a bunch of puns out of this, like Jesus is the point yeah. or turning point or starting point. Like so Meet it you just at became the point. the point. Meet yeah. you at the point, get to the point. Yeah. So we just went with the point church. There you yeah. go. Yeah, we just wanted it to be a place where folks in the community, whenever they passed it, would say, I, I know those that, that church is for me. Mm -hmm. That's a place that I, I'm comfortable at, I belong, that I could be myself. And, and whether I ever go to church there, they care about me. Mm -hmm. So would you consider the point a new church start, or would you consider a relaunch? Um, well, that's a great question. A relaunch, probably. You know, we're a 14-year-old church, but a lot of the folks that have come since the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. just like any other church, it was it was a slow ramp back up. We have a lot of new folks that, yeah, they, they thought we were a new church, and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and that's okay. And certainly our presence in the community has felt new to them. The Point has a really strong reputation as being very missional. And I can't say that was the, the case before. Very, like I said, very successful church. A lot of people came to that church, but it was very people of the church love that church. But now the community is, is much yeah. more our domain. Yeah. It had hit that life cycle in the church when it starts to atrophy a little bit, slow down, stop being invitational. You start going to the people you know in the lobby. So the relaunch was a reason to say new identity, new mission. So bring people on the elbow who you think would be a part of this. That's and that's right. what we've seen a lot of. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, I, really the DNA of the church is, you know, there's, there's all these laws of Moses, man. It gets, mm -hmm. it gets tricky. It gets confusing. What's, what's the biggest deal? And uh, love God with all you got and, and love your neighbor. Frankly, we like to say, like, you'd like to be loved. We don't, because we don't always love ourselves well. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, love, love as you love yourself. But we don't love ourselves well. We, we want to love people like, they, like we'd like to be loved and mm -hmm. like the way that Jesus loves us. And so... Yeah. Um, so we really do feel like we don't pastor a building, we pastor a community, and, and we leave with that. That's yeah. kind of, and our, and our folks, it's not when's the next thing we're doing, it's what are we doing now? I mean, we, we're, we are constantly doing some kind of missional activity, yes. donation, food collection, it's just, it's just who we are. So like one of the things that I noticed when I came to visit, mm -hmm. you don't have offices in the building Correct. at all. 
Correct. Yeah. We so our, our building's not a huge space. About half of it's the sanctuary. There's a little room in the back that we would like to make that into a, a prayer room. And then we have the kids' rooms. And we felt at first that, well, where are we gonna work? And then we realized the work wasn't the church building, the work was the people. So we needed to go where the people are. So we started meeting community members by going to the coffee shops in like middle of the meeting, someone will sit down next to us and just start a conversation. Or um, we started getting our people used to meeting us at Dorothy Lane or this coffee shop or going out to lunch or whatever, that you just kind of take it to the community rather than escape the community in a way into your church building, I think is kind of the mindset. So we just said, yeah, we're not going to meet here. We're going to meet out there. And Yeah, people. we have no intention of ever no. having offices. And, yeah. and you know, and we, 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 we think it's very intentional. Um, I, I think you, you do stuff if you, with intentionality. And so we've adopted schools and mm-hmm. uh, we even, uh, we, we have adopted a few bars that we intentionally try to hang out right. with. And so they can get to know us. And, okay, so uh, hold up for a second. Uh-huh. <laughs> Let, let's did talk I catch, about did that. Did I get you interested? <laughs> that, I'm kind of intrigued. I'm kind of intrigued. So tell us a little bit about how... Like when you say you go out into the community and mm-hmm. you build these relationships and then you start having, you do different projects with or, or projects for mm-hmm. in some cases. Yeah, for sure. We definitely have what we like to call ministry partners, mm-hmm. um, nonprofits in the area that we, we partner with. We've even started Hope for, Commun- uh, Hope for Centerville, which is, Sam and I lead that, that where we, we bring nonprofits and businesses and other churches together to try to to do missional things in the community. Um, and that's become a, a thing that the, the, the city relies on, the mayor is so familiar give with us. So some more examples of that, like what types of programs or projects? And they're um, not all in the name of the church, as uh, I understand no, it. No, we can get a lot more done when we don't care who gets the credit, uh, yeah. other than Jesus Christ. Oh, say yeah. that again. <laughs> we can get way more done when the only person we care about getting credit is Jesus Christ. Yes. Um, and that's actually a lot of our work, really. There's awareness that the point is a part of those activities, and sometimes we're leading those, but uh, that's not our main primary concern. It's that yeah. that that Jesus be um, be glorified, frankly. The one probably that galvanized the Hope for community the most is uh, the Christmas store that we had. It was a ministry that Fairhaven, a, a, a large church in the area, was doing through their church building over a weekend where their people would supply the toys and they would send out word to anyone throughout the Dayton area and even the tri-state area saying, if you just, if Christmas is a struggle for you, you can come get a very, very affordable Christmas as in like you pay $5 to get in, but you get $10 to get out. So like you (laughs) actually walk away with that. But they said, we think it'd be even better if we partner with other churches who are in this Hope For community, let's get a storefront and let's open it up all month rather than for just this weekend. So we had someone basically donate a storefront to us Care source in the area said, "Well, we'll provide coats." Yeah, healthcare provider. Yeah, right. healthcare provider. Um, we'll have winter coats that people can come through, get a winter coat for their children. We were able to hand out free Bibles for anyone who was interested. It wasn't forced, which we thought that was important. Um, mm-hmm. Resources if you're looking for a church community, you know, just some people to walk alongside you outside of Christmas. That information's there. We had again Care Source helping people get the resources they need to get free lunch if yeah. they needed for their school districts. Yeah. Um, they had all kinds of res- Just we, we wanted to help people. Uh, we didn't just want to fish for them. We wanted to help people learn how to fish. So right. Source provided a lot of re, uh, educational resources. And, right. And, and that was on top of getting kids uh, toys. So that's what it might have been the thing that attracted them. But then it became, well, we want to meet your needs come December 26th. Like, and so it became not just receiving of gifts, mm-hmm. it was receiving of information, yeah. right. receiving of resources that could be helpful to Absolutely. them beyond the We had a the prayer holiday. station set up. We prayed for and, people. And, um, yeah. and, and, you know, you have to give a church like Fairhaven credit that they bought into the vision of Hope for Centerville mm-hmm. and that um, they were already doing it, but they thought, man, how, how uh, what, a, what a God-sized dream this would be if we could partner with this collective of people. You know, Care Source as a health provider was coming to the meetings. And then we also partner with Hannah's Treasure Chest, a nonprofit that comes to get the overflow because we, we, we ended up getting more families we could even manage. Mm-hmm. We sent a thousand families to Hannah's Treasure Chest because we, we were only equipped to do like 350. Yeah. Um, yeah so it was, um, but to, like I said, to Fairhaven's credit, to another large church, Southbrook, who participated, mm-hmm. you know, they had the resources where they could have said, look at us. 
but they couldn't have done a month-long storefront without the other f- four or five churches that participated. So. so then how many – do you do you have any idea how many people were actually served through that storefront uh, during that holiday time? 350 families. It was um, about 900 children about, total. Yeah, they guesstimated about 900 children. There was like a – what was it? A $92,000 economic yeah, impact. Yeah, it was just short of 100000 which was mm-hmm. a little disappointing. But <laughs> <laughs> it made our for goal 100. for next year say um, let's have a $100,000 impact <laughs> on our community. But yeah. – you would get these stories where, again, being just connected in the community, we had someone who was a uh, school counselor in downtown Dayton, found, like knew who we were and said, I know we're not in Centerville, but this family's house burned down last week. Like, mm-hmm. it's ashes. So not only do they not have a chance at Christmas, they don't, they don't have anything. Could we grab like one of those last spots? And we were mm-hmm. able to say yes. And, yeah. and then things just kept happening. Like... Um, Checks would just keep showing up when supplies right. were getting low, or someone would just come in and write a check who we thought was coming to maybe get toys, but they're like almost like a secret shopper in a way, but they're like <laughs> leaving this giant check and just said like, yeah. heard about this. And, and the neat thing was it was right across the street from City Hall in Centerville. So you're, again, trying to live it out right at the center of, you know, government and power in that way and just saying, like, hey, we're not here to to take power. We're not here to have, you know, any worldly power. We're here to do what only the church can do. Mm-hmm. And again, it just made a really cool testament when they asked us to come and pray in January to start the year at City Hall to say, could you tell us more about that story you had set up across the street? <laughs> and it just was a very yeah, I don't know, beautiful relationship that's being formed there because of it. Yeah. And so there's some continued fruit that's going on. Last year, we did a back to school bash where we helped out several hundred kids in a neighborhood called Chevy Chase that is low income housing in Centerville. And um, so that we'll be doing that again. But as a lead up this year, we've adopted that community in general as hope for Centerville. And so we'll be providing lunches. The biggest concern when school is out, that's a safe place for a lot of those kids. It's a place to get fed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're going to provide lunches each day and activity. Um, churches are all taking weeks. And then we'll also, uh, at the uh, end of that, then have the, the, the back-to-school bash as well. But even on the weekends, there's a food-to-go program from Centerville High School that comes to our meetings that's going to provide them with food for the weekend, too. Have you seen people come to the church as a result of knowing that this is a church that's so actively involved in mission? Yes. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure, mm-hmm. for sure. Um, I don't know that that's the end game for us, but um, but yeah. Yeah, I'd say, uh, so for example, we did a um, uh, this idea that we were throwing around uh, probably on a really hard day, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> where like, um, you know, we just joked and we're like, oh, I could use a drink after that email. Like... <laughs> We're the only pastors who have ever had that thought. But uh, yeah. um, someone said it that, you know, I think Jesus would hang out in the bars more than maybe most church people are comfortable with. Just that idea that it's like he would go where the people are. Yeah. You know, it's that idea like he he would just go where the people are, and that's probably what led to a lot of his accusations. Mm-hmm. And in doing it in such a way that wasn't judgmental, but very loving and invitational. So then we said, well, as Specifically, I, you know, being a 30-year-old was looking around, I was like, most people my age do not feel comfortable letting the church know what's going on in their life. But if you sat down with them for a drink or coffee, they will tell you what's going on. Yeah, They won't put it on a connect card. They won't put it on a prayer request, or they might even say it in their small group if they go to church at all. But they will let you know what's going on. So then we started dreaming, like, what does that look like to bring Jesus into those spaces? And going through a few different breweries, we thought that was more of our move specifically. We got plugged in with the owner of um, Loose Ends, which was right down the road from our church. And we wanted to do a small group there of 20s and 30-year-olds who are not connected into church and if they are connected to church, they can come anyways because we're not doing it on Sunday. And he said, well, I, c- I can't reserve the whole space for you, but if you brought more like 100 people, we could give you the space for a night. So I said, have you ever had a church service in here? And uh, he said, no, but I think that'd be great. So we had Ash Wednesday, which yeah. was the first time they had live music in that space. And 175 came for Ash Wednesday on, yeah, that's right. in this brewery. and Standing room only. I became standing room only, and the amazing thing was we partnered with another church, a uh, restoration church in Centerville, so the bands combined, volunteers combined, everything like that by the congregations. But what was amazing was the staff of mm. the brewery, like when we were doing just rehearsal for the music, would stop like 
folding their napkins or would stop setting up menus because they were being moved by the music. Mm -hmm. And many of them, if not all, were like, I don't go to church, but there's something here. Mm -hmm. Like there's something happening in my heart. Like I remember a hostess like pulled aside, it's like, I don't know what I'm feeling right now. (laughs) And I was just like, I think that's God talking, like trying to reach you. Like that's the Father's love. And she's like, is this what church is? I was like, it's what it's supposed to be. (laughs) It's supposed to be like that. Um, It hasn't always been, unfortunately, but, you know, we're always open for more. So then that night was great. So we started having that 20s and 30s group come, and we had a waitress who became – first off, we found out they were fighting to serve us, which was kind of cool because they liked being in our group and our community. And um, one of the waitresses um, was pregnant. So we got – she was like, you're one of the first I'm telling – but I'm pregnant for the first time, and it was just very exciting. So this morning, the some of the leaders, I was on a group text with them, and someone said, hey, in my prayer time, I remembered um, that she was pregnant, that our waitress was pregnant, and um, her name was Kelsey. Aren't we supposed to take up an offering and throw a baby shower for her? Hadn't we kicked that around? And I was That's like, right. oh, you're right. So we're having a cookout with that group in two weeks at someone's house, and so we're going to take up an offering just among our group, and saying, guys, let's just go buy her like a crib or something. Like yeah. it costs three hundred dollars or something like that. Like let's just go do it. And like let's show up and surprise Kelsey like Fourth of July weekend or something. Well, and tell and them how many people are coming to that group now. Yeah. So, so the group, uh, just twenties and thirties, we started with about eight of us, and um, the group text has got up to thirty five, forty of us. Like you know, mm-hmm. just and it's just people from other churches who are hopping in saying like, hey, like, you know, again, it's the same thing. Like my church doesn't necessarily offer a young adults thing, but I don't want to leave my church. Like I don't want to leave. I, I just want to have community. And we're like, great, worship somewhere on Sundays. I think this is not meant to be a competition, but this is supposed to be an addition. That's like the idea of like not having it on a Sunday is gets... we need a middle of the week pick me up with one another and we can mm-hmm. walk through things together. So we were having people driving out from Xenia and coming up from Lebanon and, you know, Miamisburg and Springboro and Kettering, you know, coming to this brewery in Centerville saying like, I had to get a babysitter and it's 35 minutes one way, but this is the best part of my week because I can be authentic. I can be real. Someone was saying she's been in a small group for four years and said, I've never told my small group this. This is her first night. And she's like, but I hate God right now. Mm -hmm. I hate him. And now, I know we're all supposed to jump down her throat at that and wickedly defend God, but I loved uh, that the response was, that's okay. Have you told him that? Yeah, God can handle it. God can handle it. <laughs> because how many churches would actually say, well, you're probably in sin right now? Mm-hmm. And she's like, but I lost a child, mm-hmm. and I'm really hurting, and I don't know where God is. Mm-hmm. And it was we truly think it was because she had half a drink in her hand, and it was just enough to be like, can I tell you guys what's actually going on? And it was yeah. like revolutionary for her. Like it was like, oh, I can talk to God about that pain. And you're like, yes, mm-hmm. not only can you, but you should. Yeah. So, so um, it gave her permission to be vulnerable. Yes. And, and I think, again, it, that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't said, we need to go to this space. Yeah. And you know what I mean? Like create the environment for that to happen because I don't know if someone would say that in a sanctuary. I'll never forget during the pandemic, we did, uh, we kind of started some of this work and they were doing a school supply drive in Springboro and someone donated what, like 500 staplers? Mm-hmm. And they're like, we don't need staplers. <laughs> they're like, but we got, you said school supplies. And they're like, but you didn't read our list. Yeah. Staplers yeah. wasn't on the list. They're like, what do we do with these 500? And I think sometimes with, with the best of intentions, we do that with our community saying, well, we opened up a food pantry and they're like, we're good. We already have one. We need an after school program. Yeah. Like that that's where you ask and you listen rather than saying how to say this delicately, like you're you're not trying to build a platform. That's the last yeah. thing you're trying to build. You're not trying to build something like look at what our church is doing. What your church is trying to do is listen and meet the needs, not just do something that you think would be cool. Yeah, before the community, not um, tell them what you're gonna do for right. them, right? right? And so we still get humbled by this all the time. So there's a gentleman named Laurent. And I would butcher his last name, so I won't say it. It's French. But Laurent uh, has a passion for uh, refugee ministry. Uh, And so we have a lot of different refugee communities coming into South Dayton. I was so excited. And and the folks from Hope from Centerville were so excited. We were coming to him like, we're going to do this and this and this. And then he humbly just said, that's not what they need. And I said, what do they need, Laurent? 
And he said, they need friends. Mm -hmm. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. And so the decision was made then to have a dinner at Southbrook, which is one of the larger churches. And we just set up 20 of these families with 20 people that are interested in being their friends. Mm Mm-hmm. So that people they could just call, people they could go to dinner with, people that that would answer things about things that are completely foreign to them, like car insurance. (laughs) Um, Where's a good daycare for my kids? But we wanted to give them, you know, we wanted to give them clothes and food and and uh, and they wanted friends. They just wanted friends. Yeah, connection. And so you know, you get you get humbled by it all the time. You know, it's it's it's, you constantly need to learn that you need to listen more. Yeah. So I have one last question for you. Mm-hmm. What would you say to people in the United Methodist Church during times like these? I did not grow up in the United Methodist Church, but I, I did grow up kind of like a spiritual mutt. I grew up Catholic and uh, and then found like a Protestant Wesleyan faith and kind of went through through that. So I love I love the United Methodist Church. I love Wesleyan theology, but I think because of my background of working with young adults and working with a number of different ministries is I think I've been granted the freedom in some ways to not feel the burden of maintaining what's always been. Uh, Studying John Wesley and his teachings and the movements of uh, the Methodist Church when it was founded, it was was not the institution, the people didn't serve the institution, the institution served the people. And I remember reading this story, it's not a United Methodist Church story, but there's a story of a uh, a bishop from from like the fifth century when he saw the people of their town were starving, he took the gold off the walls of his church. He okay. sold it. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I'm not going to dress up this church building when the people are starving outside these walls. And I've, I remember saying like, if I ever become the pastor who cares more about the golden statues on the walls than the people that Jesus said, <laughs> mm. I was hungry and you fed me. Because mm. those statues might have been there for a long time. <laughs> and it might have been someone who de- donated them. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. There's just something there where it's like, I think we have to reevaluate. Like, what is the mission? What is your why? If yeah. you close, would anybody notice? And that's not meant to be a condemning thing. I think it's actually a beautiful invitation that God has said, let what needs to die, die. It mm. has served its purpose what needs to come in its place because the mission still continues. That's right. Yeah. And we, and we, I guess I would answer that we serve a missional God, mm-hmm. right? Um, that God's always been on mission to save us from ourselves. <laughs> Jesus Christ being the greatest example of that. And, um, and, and we're, we're lucky to be invited alongside to be a part of that mission. I am a kid who grew up in the Methodist church. I'm the mm-hmm. son of a powerhouse female pastor. But also, what did, what did John Wesley, what was his parish? The world, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it wasn't just this building. And so, at a minimum, we should be pastoring the community that we're in right. and really making that the biggest thing that we do, yep. living out the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. And it's really part of the mission statement of the Methodist Church, right? Um, to make disciples. And so, if we could get back to basics, I guess, is the yes. biggest thing and just get, just get over ourselves. For God's sakes, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> just get over ourselves and, and be about the people. It's not that complicated. Again, it has been a great joy to be with you, and I'm excited about. I can't believe I'm doing this interview the day before we move into annual conference That's time. Right. That's right. Um, but yet, I'm so inspired by your words and by your excitement and your enthusiasm for Thank ministry. You. Thank you. It's um, it's been an absolute joy. Thank mm-hmm. you. Thank you for listening to times like these. Episodes are available wherever you listen to podcasts. If this episode has touched and inspired you, please share it with a friend. If you know of someone we should feature on this program, please let us know by emailing us at wocmedia at wocumc.org. We'll see you next time.